Hola, ¿qué tal? Soy de Mantilla y esto es Quinótico en el Festival de San Sebastián. Eh, estamos aquí en directo con, en colaboración con los amigos de Fair Film Radio y hoy tenemos un invitado de excepción, Todd Haynes, que está aquí. Eh, Marinas, welcome, Todd. Thank you. Hi, great to see you. It's a pleasure to have you uh, to discuss uh, May December, Secretos de un Escándalo, in, in Spain. We, you were discussing with uh, Christine Bachon, your partner, for so many years. How many times have you been here in San Sebastián? Well, we're trying to figure that out. We really can't remember. I think it's at least three, at least three, maybe four films. Mm -hmm. And then I was also on uh, The Jury mm -hmm. uh, years ago with Diego Luna. Do you enjoy being uh, the president of a jury during your peers? This, this festival is such a special, incredible place to be uh, in so many ways. Uh, it's the really the premier festival for Latin American cinema, Spanish speaking cinema. Uh, but the setting, the food, the way we're mm -hmm. taking care of. So to be a, the president of the jury at San Sebastian is a thing unto itself. Mm -hmm. I remember reading that uh, it was Natalie Portman, uh, the one who brought the project to you. Yes, that's uh, true. She read the screenplay and said, this has to be done by Todd Haynes. Had you even talked about uh, working with her before that moment? We, actu we actually had. We'd sort of been in discussion on another project years earlier. So there was an interest on both our parts to try to figure out something to do together. Mm -hmm. When she sent me this script, this was in the height of COVID. Nobody was working in the United States. There's a lot of stuff circulating, a lot of speculation about what to do next. This script, so I was seeing a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But this script really rose to the top. It was a really unique and, and beautiful... And what did you like about the, the script by Sammy Burt? Uh, Sammy's script uh, tells this story this tabloid sort of scandal set 20 years in the past mm -hmm. and uses the sort of vehicle of an actor coming to town to research a character as a way into the story and to sort of start to unpack what that story really was about. Mm -hmm. uh, but the script keeps you incredibly disquieted and puts you in a state of sort of moral uncertainty as you watch it, as you read it. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just found that to be so bold daring and confident in a, a young a first screenwriter and thought okay my challenge then would be how to translate those same mm -hmm. ways of reading against the grain of the story as a viewer of a film that's interesting vamos a ver un clip de el último superviviente una película de Barry Levinson que ya está en los cines y estamos en 20 segundos de nuevo con Todd me interesa su historia soy el superviviente de Auschwitz pero nadie sabe cómo lo consiguió la chica que dejé en mi país no sabe que estoy vivo. Quiero convertirte en una atracción. ¡Traidor! Necesito ganar. No puedes, pero puedes sobrevivir. ¿Merece la pena luchar por ella? Justo voy y digo mal el título el día que tenemos a los compañeros de Diamond Films con nosotros, el superviviente de Auschwitz, ya, ya en cines con Barry Levinson. Uh, Todd, I wanted to ask you about the more campy, because the American reviews were like, camp, 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 and it was a really fun part of the movie. Was that in the screenplay, or did you want to add that element, like, for example, the, the scene with the Fritz was so funny? There was humor in the script, evident, evident humor in the script. I never considered the film campy. I don't consider it campy. I don't, it's not a word that came from me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I still don't. I don't think there's anything campy about the subject matter or the performances or the visual language of the film. The music, the music. plays yeah. a very strong role in the film, but it's only in that one sting moment with a zoom shot and a sting of music that I think people like latch onto that. Because the, the, the music throughout the film, it comes from the film The Go-Between, Joseph Losey's film, uh, Michelle Legrand's score for that film. It, camp is not a way of describing that music. The music is astonishing and strong, but uh, but I but I like. Of course, I'm interested in camp. I love camp. It's a way of, it's a way that the, there's a distance between the viewer and what they're looking at, and a way that you have to interpret it. And in that regard, I think that's what people are trying to describe. And were you surprised by that, that label when the yeah. film the film yeah, came out? That's interesting because you never know how a, a film is going to be perceived. Sure. The reviews were really good, yeah. but uh, they um, talk about that element. I wanted to, to ask you about the, about the DP because uh, you couldn't work this time with Edward Lackman. He was injured. Yes. Uh, how was uh, working with Christopher Blavart? Blavart, 
I've known Chris for many years. I, I know his work very, very well, particularly through the work he's done with Kelly Reichert. Uh, he worked under Harris Savides, one of our great cinematographers, uh, who shot movies for Gus Van Sant. So I've known Chris for a long, long time. It was such a pleasure to work with him. He's an incredibly smart, incredibly detailed um, creative partner. And the entire, uh, there are a lot of new relationships on this movie, including Sam Lysenko, the production designer I'd never worked with before, uh, uh, April Napier, who did the costumes I'd never worked with before. It brought a fresh energy and an excitement to the making of this film. We were talking about Natalie before. How is mixing someone new as Natalie and someone as Julianne, who has been working with you for 30 years now? It, 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 was an, it, was, it was an amazing thing to behold. Mm -hmm. And the two women really, look, when I first started to talk to Natalie about the script, mm -hmm. the way she talked about the script, her intellect, her cunning, the almost mischievous way that she, want, that she delighted in upsetting expectations in an audience reminded me of Julianne. Mm -hmm. And then here was this other role sitting right there of somebody Julianne's age. So it was an incredible opportunity for me to work with these two incredibly seasoned, powerful performers um, in, this, in, this, in this story. You were talking earlier about Kelly Reinhardt, about Gus Van Sant, and you, you are uh, big names in the indie scene, in, in the American cinema. How do you feel about the, the current state of independent movies in America? I don't, I think it's a constantly shifting uh, term, meaning uh, films acquire their financing in such a myriad of different ways. You know, this is the first film that we've done in quite some time that was financed solely by uh, some foreign pre-sales and equity investment. And the first time I've ever come to a festival with no distributor attached to the film. It was a very low budget film. We shot the movie in 23 days. So every, every film's experience, every film's model of how the money gets put together is different and pursuant and, and, and relevant to that moment and that particular challenge of getting that movie made. Mm -hmm. You have worked mostly out of the system. Uh, have you ever had, uh, had call, calls from Hollywood, from a studio, to say, Todd, we want you to take a look at this material? You know, my, I, my agent knows well enough that there's a lot of kinds of films that would probably not interest me. That said, I get a lot of different kinds of things sent to me. A uh, participant produced uh, Dark Waters, for instance, which was a studio production, an, uh, an amazing project that came to me through Mark Ruffalo. I've worked with HBO, um, worked with Amazon. So, so these are studios that, we, that, I, that I've had great and very different kinds of relationships with. It seems that, that the strike, at least the writer's strike, is about to end. So, how you're seeing it, uh, seeing it from being an, an, an indie name in the system? How do you feel about the strike with the actors and the writers? Again, the the indie category is for me a semi, more than semi permeable. It's a it, it doesn't. I've worked in studios. I, actors work in independent films, studio films, and combinations of the two. So really, it's about looking after the different ways that films are getting. Uh, programmed, streamed, uh, episodic television, and how to fairly pay for the kind of work that's invest involved in those kinds of films and the kind of money that studios accrue from those kinds of projects. Mm -hmm. And it's complicated, but we've dealt with this, we've dealt with comparable changes in technology, distribution uh, in the past, you know? And we'll figure out a way, just we really need to all put our heads together and realize we have a common goal, mm -hmm. which is to get back to work. Right now, you have to be open, for example, uh, May-December in Spain is going to open in cinemas with Diamond Films, and then in the uh, US you are going with Netflix for the first time, I think? It's the first time, but it will be a theatrical release. Uh, as well. Yeah. How, how were the, those talks? Oh, it was, it's been great so far. I've enjoyed them completely. They knew how much a theatrical release means to me, how, how primary that is to mm -hmm. a deal that we would make. And they've honored that, and they're really giving us their, 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 their you know, a thorough commitment to 25 major markets to open the film theatrically. Um, but they've been great. They understand the film. They're excited by the film. The materials they've been producing for the film are so true to the spirit of the film. So, so far it's been, it's been a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. 
I think you're good doing next a gay drama set in the 30s with Joaquin Phoenix. And I remember that Almodovar was talking when he has released now a uh, strange way of life that now he didn't want to show uh, characters having sex. Uh, they, he prefers uh, having them talk about desire, maybe. How are you tackling this? Because it's your first big love story, maybe? Or what uh, kind well, of film is going to be? Uh, Carol was probably no, what I would male, call. Male, I mean, oh yeah, oh, my, my first, first Carol is a classic. Yes, uh, my first feature film was Poison, which dealt with mm -hmm. gay male desire um, in three separate stories, and uh, and mostly focused in one story, one of the three stories, but fueled by, inspired by the writing of Jean Genet, very much a product of the times we were in around mm -hmm. AIDS and HIV. So it's been a while since I've gone back to a gay male. Uh, love story. These are two very unlikely characters who find their way to each other. It's an inter interracial relationship with people from very different stations of power in the society. And so the physical relationship takes on a volatility mm -hmm. that is the way they find their way to affection and love for each other. So it's a very, it's, I'm very excited about it. It's a unique, complicated um, way that they find their way to each other. Mm -hmm. And do you, have, do you already know who is going to play with we don't. Joaquin? No. And Joaquin is quite a particular actor. How has been working with him so far? This is a project that initiated from my conversations with Joaquin when he called me up. I had some ideas, different, not very, you know, floating ideas that were so interesting. We started to talk and develop them. I brought up my friend John Raymond in as a writer partner for, with me. And the three of us kept developing these ideas, turning them over and getting deeper and deeper and finding our way closer, I think, to the core of the film, which is really this sexual and mm -hmm. romantic connection between these two men. Um, but Joaquin is, was there from the start as a creative force. And that was just been that's been very very interesting. And he's going to be in the screenplay as well. I read. Yeah, he's he, the writing of the screenplay that's will cool. be shared between the three of us. You were talking about uh, the story. I'm sorry, the yeah. story. You were talking about Poison, uh, which opened in '91. It won at Sundance, but it was a very different uh, time for queer stories. Now there are many more voices uh, telling these kind of, of movies and TV shows. How do you feel about the state of queer cinema? I think. There's a broad and diverse range of representation of characters, gay characters, queer characters, trans characters, um, and, and a real desire to sort of start representing people who have not been seen on screen and in stories before. And I think that's all incredibly important. And I think mm -hmm. that comes from the energy that began in new queer cinema in the 90s. Um, but that was such a specific time and very, very different time. And there was a sort of political and cultural urgency mm -hmm. to f films coming out and being made at that time, which is a, a bit different today. Although, when you see the ways in which the far right in America have been latching on to and targeting cultural politics, trans um, identity and education, mm -hmm. gay people and gay rights and gay freedoms, and making that the new uh, target of their campaigns politically. Mm -hmm. You wonder how, how much we've actually progressed. Yes. Are you still working with uh, Kate in Trust? Kate Winslet? I am. Uh, and it's going to be after? I'm not sure what the order, everything will come in. There's another couple projects in the mix. It's this one, Trust, is a, uh, means a great deal to me. It's very exciting. And why are you so excited about it? Oh, it's just the most remarkable novel. And I've gotten to know Hernan Diaz, the writer of the novel. I had such a great experience with Kate when we did Mildred Pierce mm -hmm. at uh, uh, HBO. And that was the first time any of us did episodic television. And we really brought a cinematic and film you know, experience to the small screen for that project. And she's had an ongoing Obviously, mm -hmm. very successful, very exciting relationship with HBO ever since. It's a different HBO than the one I knew, different people, but I think it's, a, the, 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 it's an incredibly you know, formidable uh, company. You were talking about adapting a novel. Uh, with mid-December, you uh, take another writer's project. How uh, do you uh, face a project, depending if you're the writer, if you're not? Does it change the way you do a film? 
You know, at the point where you are taking the pages and trans the words on the page and trying to find images and try to tell a story in images, which is what cinema really is, whether it's something I've written and whether I've started that process in the act of writing or not, and of course it happens in the act of writing, you can't not be Im picturing what you're, what you're writing. It's still a transition from one version to another. It's still a letting go of what's on the page and a commitment to what you actually find in the world. The actors that you assemble, the time and place in which you shoot the movie, and all those things take precedence. And you know, what I think most directors know is you have to let go of what you pictured before, whatever it is, whether you wrote it or someone else wrote it. You have to discard it and look very keenly at what's in front of you each stage of the way. Now you have worked with Julianne, with Rooney, with Kate, with the other Kate. Who is in your wish list? If you can tell me like one name of an actress that would you, you would love to work with. There's still so many. Um, Marion Cotillard. I want to see that, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And one last question. Our friends of filming want to know, what was the, the film that changed your life and how? Or, or films, if you have more I than mean, one. I mean, films continue to change your life at different phases of your life, right? And the formative years when you're young are times when certain films uh, take you by the throat and the heart and the soul. And obviously, the, the very first movie I ever saw was Mary Poppins. That had a seismic effect on my imagination. And following that film, and it would make, it made me have a creative response to that experience. The need to recreate it in images, drawings, painting, you know, replay the power of the, of the cinematic moment in the films. And that would continue. My next obsession as a child was Romeo and Juliet. And they would sort of go from there. A film of my more mature years when I was still in high school that I still watch Um, and it's, it's still a, a remarkable education in filmmaking is performance, the film performance mm -hmm. by Nicholas Rogue and Donald Camel. Uh, Nicholas Rogue's work is so extraordinary, but Donald Camel's role in that film and the combination, that, that partnership between the two, created something utterly unique. I have to say that my favorite film of, of yours is Still Carol, but tonight I'm going to watch again May December because I want to share it with friends and I'm, I know I'm going to enjoy it a lot. Thank so you. So thank you, Todd. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so you. much. Great to see you again. Thank you. Vosotros podéis ver Secretos de un Escándalo en cines el 1 de diciembre o estos días en San Sebastián, si tenéis suerte y estáis aquí. Volvemos con Christine Bachon, la productora de Todd y muchas otras películas del cine indie de los últimos 30 años, ahora mismo en Quinótico.com es la primera con K y la segunda con C. ¡Hasta pronto!